Greetings in the name of Yeshua. I'm so happy you've joined us. I'm Noreen Jacks with Bible Interact. Welcome to today's presentation. We will be studying part four of Ancient Traditions from the Hebrew Scripture. I have entitled today's lesson, Purim, The Power and the Passion. I'm going to tell you today why I think Christians should celebrate the Feast of Purim and what fun it can be for us as we commemorate with our Jewish brethren the great victory they had over evil in that day. And it reminds us of the tremendous victory that Yeshua won for us over the enemy of our soul. So the history of Purim is set in uh, Persia, about 480 BC. Now, just to give a little background, um, the exiles of Judah had been held captive in Babylon for 40 years. This was chastisement for their failure to obey the laws of God, particularly the laws concerning Shabbat, the laws of rest. And the Jews prospered by the grace of God while in Babylon until the wicked Haman, or as he is known in Hebrew as Haman, came on the scene. Now, Haman was the Agagite descendant of King Amalek that we read about in, uh, in Exodus 17. And he came from a long line of anti-Semites. Amalek was the king that the Israelites encountered in the desert. And he is the one that the Israelites were battling against when Aaron and Hur had to hold up the, uh, the arms of um uh, Moses, the intercessor, during the battle. If Moses' arms got tired and he put them down, then they stopped winning the battle. But his helpers came and lifted up his arms, and then the battle went on. So that's who they were fighting at this time, the Amaleks, Amalekites, rather. And then uh, God swore to blot out the memory of the Amalekites in Exodus 17, verse 14. He said, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Well, we'll talk a little bit about why that was so. Now, first we're going to talk about the lineage of Mordecai and Haman. Uh, and Mordecai is, is the hero. Esther is the heroine of the book of Esther. Now, when we look back at history, we will see that the forefathers of Haman and Mordecai cross paths at several junctures in Israel's history. Now, if you look at the chart, on the screen, you will see that we begin this lineage with Abraham, and he fathered, Esau, he fathered Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. So we're going to go from those lineages. Now, Jacob had a son, Benjamin, one of the 12 sons. Jacob was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Benjamin was the ancestor of King Saul, the very first king of Israel. Saul was a Benjaminite. And we know from the scriptures that Mordecai was also a Benjaminite. So we see his lineage here very clearly. Then when we look to the other side and we look at the descendants of Esau, we see that Amalek was the grandson of Esau. And then he had a descendant, Agog, actually his son. And Agog was the ancestor many years previously to Haman. So the Amalekites were the arch enemies of Israelites since the time of the conquest. They cowardly attacked the, the young and the old, the most feeble among the Israelite sojourners while they were in the desert. And God commanded his people to blot out their memory uh, because of this, to blot out their memory under heaven. And that was in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 through 19. And he emphasized this command with the words, do not forget, very emphatic statement, do not forget. So here we have King Saul meeting Agog and his fellow Amalekites on the battlefield about 380 years later. Now let's read this passage in 1 Samuel chapters 15, verses 8 and 9. He, speaking of King Saul, captured Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. This was what he was commanded to do. However, he did not fulfill the command entirely because he allowed the king to live. The next verse tells us that Saul and the people spared Agog and the best of the sheep, the oxen and the fatlings, the lamb and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them in disobedience. But everything that was despised and worthless that they went ahead and destroyed. So Saul disobeyed God's command, and he spared 
the king's life in in uh, 1 Samuel 15, verses 2 and 3. Well, just a few verses later in that same passage, we read how Samuel came and he killed Agog because Saul had failed to do so. Now, Jewish tradition informs us that Agog sired a son while in captivity uh, with a woman who was also in captivity. And, of course, then his seed was perpetuated. Now, uh, Agag's seed then survived to torment Israel generations later, this time not in Canaan, but all the way over in Persia. So the lesson here for all believers is that failure to obey God's voice, God's commands, will eventually lead to much grief and calamities in our life. But even partial disobedience to God is full disobedience. We must be very careful to listen to what he tells us to do. So going back to the origin of the lineages of Haman and Mordecai, we read the following passage that is very enlightening. And this is from Genesis 25, verses 22 and 23. The babies jostled each other within Rebekah's womb. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So this tells us that the battle between Haman and Mordecai literally began in the womb of Rebekah, of Revkah's womb, many years earlier. We have so many if-onlys in our lives and so many if-onlys in the scripture. So the battle if Saul had slain Agag according to God's command, the Jews would not have faced this life-threatening battle many years later in Persia. So let me tell you now a little bit about Haman's evil scheme. The wicked Jew hater devised a scheme to rid the land of all Jews. Uh, he attempted to annihilate them in a single day, and he did this through a conniving method with the blessing of the king. And sensing grave danger then, Mordecai, when he became aware of this plan, he petitioned his cousin, Queen Esther, to intervene. And he said, who knows but that you were brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. Very powerful words that we need to keep in mind all the time, to know what God has called us to do at any specific time. So the courageous monarch dared to enter the presence of the king uninvited. Even though she was his queen, his wife, she did not have the right to do what she did, and she went at the peril of her life. Because of the prayers of God's people, because of the three days of fasting that had taken place, the king very graciously extended his scepter, and she was invited into his presence. So while in there, she mediated successfully a couple of occasions to successfully defend her people. She allowed, she convinced the king of their need to protect themselves. So they were allowed to defend themselves against Haman. And victory was sweet. Uh, we read in Esther chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 that Haman was hanged. We also learn that his 10 sons were slain. He lost his seed, which was the greatest curse in antiquity for someone not to have seed to be perpetuated through the generations. Now Haman was publicly executed on the very gallows that he had personally prepared for Mordecai, whom he hated desperately. So we see poetic justice taking place here. And then the king made Mordecai second in command. He made him visor of the nation, directly under the king. And he also made him lord over the house of Haman. Tremendous blessings. This was the God-given reward for Mordecai, who had sought the deliverance of his people. And at this point, Mordecai instituted the festival of Purim. This is not a God-ordained feast, but it is a biblical feast because it's written in the scriptures. Now, this is a celebration of the triumph of good over evil. And I personally feel very good about celebrating with anyone who's triumphing of good over evil. So uh, he commanded that a letter be sent out to all the people in all the provinces, urging them to commemorate this event annually on the 14th and 15th day of Adar, which occurs in the spring, generally in March. 
And the idea of this commemoration or celebration was to show that their sorrow had been turned into joy, hallelujah, and that their mourning had turned into celebration, something that only God can do. So he wrote the following in Esther chapter 9, verse 22. He wrote them to observe the days of feasting and joy and giving of presents and food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the story of Purim is told in synagogues on the on these days of Adar every spring. And fasting and feasting are both a part of this commemoration. The fasting recalls the bitterness of persecution, and the feasting recalls the joy of victory, the sweetness of victory. And in the midst of their feasting, they are also required to remember the poor in their midst. Now, Esther chapter 9, verse 28 says, These days should be remembered and observed in every generation, by every family, and in every province, and in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them be die out from among their descendants. So, here we have Mordecai and Esther, the seed of King Benjamin, of King, the seed of King Saul, Saul the Benjaminite, and he, they were raised up many years later to complete the work that their ancestor had failed to do because of disobedience many years earlier. Had Saul obeyed the Lord and put Agag to death as instructed, uh, the threat of annihilation to the Jews at this point in history would never have occurred. So what we witness in, in this passage here is... Um, the age-old battle that's continuing on even to this day. So I, I think the idea of Purim is a tremendous idea, and I heard about it first from a friend of mine who's part of a Messianic congregation. And she told me the wonderful experience she had had this one particular week uh, celebrating the Feast of Purim, and I was intrigued by it. I just wished I could hop a plane and be there. And I said, next year I'm coming. So in the interim, I researched everything I could find on the feast. And lo and behold, it was such a blessing to me that I wanted to share it with the women of my church. So that's exactly what I did. I organized a Purim party, and it was so much fun. Now, you wonder how did the ladies like it, women who had never heard of Purim, other than what they've read in the book of Esther? They said it was the most fun they ever had in church. And if you haven't had one in your church, I would encourage you to do so because it is tons of fun and it has a very profound meaning that um, should be close to all of our hearts, the idea of victory over the enemies of our soul. Praise the Lord. Now, um, you might say Purim parties for Christians. Well, I say absolutely. And I would encourage you to do this. And if, if you are not comfortable doing this, I'd be happy to come and help you celebrate Purim at your church. You can contact me at BibleInteract.com. But in the remaining part of our session, I want to tell you how to have a Purim party. And I'm going to make it easy for you. And all of these notes will be available in the study booklet that comes with the presentation, the DVD presentation that's available from Bible Interact. The first thing I did was to make a flyer, and I have a copy of it up on the screen for you, and I entitled this Purim, The Power and the Passion. You come up with whatever title the Lord gives you, and I don't mind if you want to use this one. That's fine with me. And this is about Queen Esther's triumph over the enemy of God's people. We had a dramatic presentation then by the youth group of my church, and that was a lot of fun. One of the ladies wrote a skit, and we involved as many of the youth girls as possible. The Bible says that the younger should train the older, so that's what we did. We wanted to impart the power of passion and passion of Purim into their hearts, and they were blessed. So what we did was uh, we selected seven girls to be the seven handmaidens of Esther. They were the girls who were preparing Esther to meet the king, and they came dressed in beautiful costumes that we have in our prop department. You probably have them in your church too, just utilize them. Purim is all about wearing costumes and it really adds to the festive. Even the guests came wearing costumes at my request and it helped everybody get into the spirit of this. So 
as the girls uh, addressed Esther during parts of the play, they would come with, with bottles, lotions, and so forth, and read from the bottles, oh, Esther, this lotion will preserve your skin, and, and this lotion has another benefit to you. And they just read all their lines right off the bottles. So it meant for very little rehearsal time, because I didn't want to take them away from the homework. That was the mother in me. So they did a great job, and they learned, we all learned, and it was, it was a very pleasant time. And we had background music going on, uh, Middle Eastern music to kind of set the ambiance also. Then the next thing happened was I gave a message that I entitled, Preparing for His Presence, the Subjection of Esther's Flesh. And what I did was spiritualize all the concepts that came out about the physical preparation that Esther made to prepare herself to meet the king. And so uh, that became a meaningful way of making a personal application of all that we were doing to all the ladies present. Then, as you see on the PowerPoint, I have a prerequisite for attendance. The first thing is very important. Encourage everyone who's coming to read the Book of Esther in its entirety at least once before the event. That way you won't have to spend a lot of time giving background. You can get right into the celebration because you have to read parts of it in there. But the more they know about it ahead of time, the better. Then you will have them write the name of Haman on the soles of their feet. And that is so they can stomp out the names of Haman. And if you can imagine a church full of women stomping their feet and shouting, it's, it's tons of fun. The whole idea is to hiss and to boo at the name of Haman, that you will wipe his name out from the face of the earth. And then you encourage them to bring noisemakers. And I brought a selection of noisemakers for you here today. I have a little pom-pom here. And this one is called Click and Shake. I hope you can hear that clicking. It makes a racket. And then I have birthday party whistles. <laughs> Quite the noisemakers. You can take rattles, anything you have around your house. Baby rattles work great. And then I have other horns. <laughs> So people came loaded up with noisemakers. And the other thing that's very important is to bring rocks. And I have written on the name of this the name Haman. The idea is to blot out his name over all the earth. And what fun this is. Can you hear that? It makes quite a racket when you have a room full of people banging out the name of Haman. And it makes for a very festive occasion. And it's a lot of fun. And everybody's filled with joy. So we had a tremendous evening of fun, food, and fellowship. Now, let me tell you the order of ceremony, uh, order of service that was conducted first. We had Purim party etiquette to begin. And I will tell you what that is. I will read this to you. Now, bear in mind that the worship team that I put in place had no idea what Purim was. This was brand new to every single person present. And it was my very first experience with Purim also. So I wrote out a message that I wanted the worship leader to share with the people. I called it Purim Party Etiquette. I will read that to you now. And this was to give instructions so they would know exactly what to do. The message of Purim evokes great passion and emotion because the wicked Haman was the enemy of the Jews. His name must be blotted out on all the earth for all generations. As the book of Esther is read to the congregation during the festival of Purim, participants are expected to boo and hiss at the mention of his shameful name. Noisemakers may also be used to drown out the vile sound of his detestable name. Tradition demands that the name of Haman be written on stones and on the soles of one's shoes for the purpose of stomping on him. Both Haman and Satan, or Hasatan, are under our feet. Tonight is a time for merrymaking and rejoicing for the deliverance of the Jewish people through the humble, obedient intercession of Queen Esther, the faithful Mordecai, and the mercy of Almighty God. As Christians, we celebrate our salvation through Yeshua HaMashiach and the one who conquered death, hell, and the grave on our behalf. Then the worship leader encouraged the people to practice. Now, we're going to say the name Haman in a few places, and every time we say it, you've got to hear it and respond immediately with the noisemakers. And then they said, we'll even have reminders on the overhead projector in case you forget. Well, guess what? They didn't need any practice. They got so into this, and they got so filled with the joy of the Lord, and everybody had 
a great time. And then we told them, okay, now leave your inhibitions at the door and enter into Purim, the power and the passion. Now, back to our order of service. Uh, after the etiquette was, was read, then we had worship, and that included a lot of Jewish mood, Jewish music to set the mood. And then, of course, the bells and the horns and the stones and all that were going off continually. Then we had the reading of the Megillah. That is the scroll of Esther. Now, I understand when this is done in the synagogue, it takes about three hours because they read through the whole scroll. Well, I didn't have three hours, so I selected a passage and uh, that I thought would be most meaningful for our group, and I invited two young girls to do the reading. They were only 10 and 12, but they were very proud to be included in this presentation, and their mother was delighted. So very important to include as many people as you can. Then we had the play. And then next was the message, and then was the offering. Now, I have to tell you about the offering, very important part. In order for a Purim service to be acceptable, four requirements are necessary. The first one is that the book of Esther must be read in its entirety. The second one, we have to be reminded that the festival must be a time of great rejoicing. So you must come to the festival with a heart full of the joy of the Lord. And the purpose is to remember to uh, praise God for the Jews' deliverance over uh, the enemy and our deliverance over Hasatan. Purim is also a very special time for the giving of gifts to family and friends. You might even want to incorporate a new biblical tradition into your family by giving gifts to your children during this time, and they will love this tradition. I had a Purim celebration with my granddaughters and their friend, and it was an incredible time for us. I've done this with Passover and other things, just so I can give them a, a visualization of the Word of God to make it as meaningful as possible. My goal is to help them hide it in their hearts. And they said, oh, Grandma, can we do this again next year? It was so much fun for them. Then the last thing to make a kosher Purim celebration is to have an offering for the poor. Very important. And we did this through the Southern Gospel Convention, which I had just learned, sent 100% of the donations to the designated cause. So we um, sent it to hurricane victims, and it made us feel very, very good. So praise God, all these four requirements are so important. Then, I, when we were concluded with everything, the one man in the production, Mordecai, came forth, and he was regally dressed in royal robes. This was the exalted Mordecai, the one who had been placed up on a pedestal as the ruler of the people following the victory. And he came wearing his beautiful crown, and he stood up there in a very eloquent voice, and he thanked everybody for coming to celebrate the feast that he had instituted thousands of years ago. And he invited everyone to come to the palace for a celebration, for a party, a feast that had been prepared by his cousin Esther, the queen, and her handmaidens. So together, we went into the fellowship hall, following Mordecai's leading, and there it was delightful. We had decorated the fellowship hall in so many ways. We had a, a large sign standing up that's uh, a banner, like a scroll, and it said, Hag Sameach, Happy Feast. And that was very beautifully done. And we had the pillars in the fellowship hall decorated with netting, and we put gold stars in them to make it look like a palace. You can just let your imagination go wild. All the people got into this in a big way. And the hall was beautiful, and we had mood music there, too. We had Jewish music of celebration. It was a wonderful time. And then we had hamantash until it was coming out our ears. That's the traditional food, little triangular-shaped pastry uh, that's known as haman's pockets. And it's filled with poppy seed filling or fruit filling, and it's they're very delicious. You can get countless recipes online. I encourage you to do that. And the ladies got so excited, so many women volunteered to make hamantash. And so it was a real cultural experience for everyone, as well as a spiritual experience. And I can't tell you how much fun it was. And then we also served typical Mediterranean food. We had olives and 
dates and foods of that nature. And the music was going on, and it was a tremendous evening of fun, food, and fellowship. And uh, every year they say, let's do it again, let's do it again. And I hope we can do it again this year, and I hope that you will take the time. And if you do, I would love to see your pictures. If you could email them to me at BibleInteract.com, I'd be happy to put them on my website in the future. I encourage others to do this. We have wonderful privileges that God gives us through his words to celebrate feasts from ancient days, and they're very meaningful in our days. And all of the feasts of Israel, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, uh, they all point to Yeshua, as we know them in Hebrew as Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Every aspect of this in symbolism points to him, uh, every type and shadow. So I encourage you to study the whole, the Hebrew scriptures and learn from them, apply them to your life, because they were given to us as an example by Almighty God. And I, until we meet again, I say shalom. <music>